It's my uh, great pleasure to welcome all of you to our second GenMig research webinar. Uh, I'm Eva Ackerman Borje, and I'm the Director of Policy Knowledge and Research at IOM headquarters here in Geneva. And for those of you who are new uh, to GenMig, the Gender and Migration Research Policy Action Lab, uh, it was launched uh, in March 2023 by IOM's Deputy Director General for Operations, Ms. Ogochi Daniels. So, uh, <clears throat> GenMig leverages the vast knowledge and expertise uh, of IOM and its partners to drive uh, action uh, in, for addressing gendered vulnerabilities, guided by an evidence-based rights-based and migrant-centered approach. And GenMig is supported by a global network of now over 500 partners from 300 research institutions, governments, UN agencies, other I, uh, international organizations, uh, non-governmental -organi uh, organizations and the private sector who, who are all committed uh, to gender equality. And GenMig is uh, guided by a multi-stakeholder multi approach to deliver gender responsive solutions and strengthening migrants' resilience through actions. And to date, we have hosted 15 virtual events with some uh, 900 people uh, uh, attending. This has included private dialogues for GenMig partners and also public events for International Migrants Day, for example, and International Women's Day, as well as side events to the UN General Assembly and the Global Forum on Migration and, and Development. Transformative dialogue, uh, which is what we are aspiring to, is already bearing fruits with a GenMig partner initiative currently in development with also the private sector. We will keep you up to date on these uh, important new developments. Next slide, please. <laughs> uh, records of uh, previous public events, records, sorry, or recordings, I should say, uh, of uh, previous public events are available uh, to all to have a look at on the GenMig webpage, a dedicated page, uh, which you can find in the link in the chat, but also uh, with the QR code on, on the slide. Uh, it in includes a recording of our International Women's Day event in partnership with the UK government and UN Women, for instance, and our first re research webinar, which was held on the 17th of of April. There are also other resources on, on this web page. So if I could have the next slide. Um, if you would like to join uh, our partner network and have access to our partner dialogues and various different resources that will be shared throughout our fourth, through this uh, um, uh, forthcoming microsite, uh, we hope uh, that we can launch this site in the coming month. So please click on the link that is now being provided in, in the chat for you and fill out the form or, or scan the QR code on, on, on this uh, slide that you see right now. And within this context, the public webinar series will give you the opportunity to, to hear from researchers on the breadth of topics related to migration and gender we, we really hope that this series will go some way to improve knowledge sharing uh, on the issues and topics that most affect women migrants and that render migration and displacement deeply gendered processes. We have had several research webinars during the year and the next one will be on the 3rd of July and will focus on the experiences of women and girls from Afghanistan after the Taliban takeover. And to register for that um, event, you can uh, see in the chat that uh, you will uh, 
uh, to get more information about uh, registration for that. If you are interested in presenting your work uh, at one of our research webinars, please do get in contact uh, uh, with us. Uh, you will find us at research at IOM, uh, dot in, And we will maybe not <clears throat> be able to accommodate you immediately in the next few months, but please know that we are very interested in your work and we will also assist you in planning uh, together with us for future events and, and engagements. So today's webinar, and I think that is the slide we're looking at now, uh, will showcase research exploring access to sexual and reproductive health services for migrant women and girls. Access to and utilization of healthcare by migrant women is often low due to, to various factors, including migration status, language barriers, and stigma exclusionary policies and traditional cultural practices within migrant communities. These barriers, pores and challenges are often exacerbated when it comes to sexual and reproductive health rights and, and services. Improving access to these services is central to the broader SDG target 3.7 of achieving universal access to sexual and reproductive health services. So this webinar will showcase research on migrant women's experiences of sexual and reproductive health in different contexts and explore opportunities to improving access to sexual and reproductive health rights and services for women and girls in migration and displacement contexts. So on that note, I would like to take the opportunity to thank our speakers for joining today. And I will now hand over to Mari McAuliffe, who is the head of migration research and publications in IOM. Please, Mari, over to you. Thanks so much, Eva. And thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, this is a really important uh, topic. We are delighted to have very distinguished speakers who are working across a range of different geographies joining us on the topic of access to sexual and reproductive health services for migrant women and girls. Um, as Eva mentioned, my name is Mari McAuliffe. I head up the Migration Research and Publications Division for IOM and also edit the World uh, Migration Report. We'll quickly go to the speakers. Thanks again for joining us. Uh, we will take very short um, presentations some of the key insights from the latest research and analysis from our presenters. Then we will go to a Q&A session at the end. So please do feel free to put any questions, comments, or even share resources in the chat function. And we'll be able to go to a discussion after all of our speakers have presented. So the first uh, speakers uh, I will turn to now from the University of Southampton. Professor Pia Rigizorosi, sorry for that Pia, and Professor David uh, Owen have joined us. They are, as I mentioned, from the University of Southampton and they're part of a project which is redressing gendered health inequalities of displaced women and girls. Very interesting project, very central to this topic of access to sexual and reproductive health services, and particularly for displaced women and girls in Central and South America. Uh, Pia and David will be presenting, Pia doing the presentation. David's also joined us. Thank you very much, David, for being with us too. And I will hand over now to Pia for the presentation. Thanks, Pia. Thanks, Marie. Thank you very much. And thanks uh, to the, the whole IOM research team. I, I, this is a, a very um, exciting project and very pleased to be part of, of this seminar. So let me share the presentation and I hope everyone can see it. Um, just give me a quick note if, uh, can you see it? Great, that looks yep, good. Great, thank you. thank you. Okay, so yeah, this is a project that together with David and other colleagues in Central America, Colombia and Brazil, including the IOM in Central America, uh, have been working for uh, a few years now, since 2019. Uh, it's a very complex project in that we um, address this in a kind of a plurality of methodologies. And the um, main focus, of course, is uh, to work uh, not just about, uh, but with the displaced women and girls in two 
corridors of migration. So the project is uh, redressing gender health inequalities, and for that we um, uh, approach it in in terms of um, collecting uh, innovative data, innovative uh, quantitative data, uh, for assessing health status, uh, not just in 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 places of um, settlement or, or, or border areas, but also trying to capture the, the transit as well and the different health uh, perception of health needs, uh, status and access uh, conditions that they experienced in their uh, transit. And for that, we work in the um, uh, women moving from uh, Venezuela to Colombia and Brazil, but also with returnees uh, in Central America, uh, particularly in El Salvador and Honduras. So the survey involved, um, we, it was co-created with IOM Central America and had different modules and all, all those modules captured different aspects of sexual and reproductive health. And we work with the population of women and girls in reproductive age based on a World Health Organization definition, so 15 to 49. And we disaggregated by age and by different uh, aspects uh, issues of sexual and reproductive health, you know, from, from, from issues of menstruation to issues of pre and postnatal uh, care. So uh, in addition to that, we did a lot of focus groups, not just with women and with girls, but also with health professionals and health authorities and migration authorities. Uh, and of course, we complemented that with interviews and the photo voice uh, and a documentary, which was really fundamental, especially the photo voice activity, because we were working with uh, migrant women and girls to uncover their lived experiences, to actually give them that space uh, to exercise their voice and, and rights to explain what in their perspectives were the health needs in terms of sexual reproductive health, but also uh, the, the barriers and how they experience issues of uh, violence, self-care, caring for others uh, and access to health care. And with them as well, uh, we uh, co-created what we called the Agape Guide, which is a, effectively a, a guide that is in print, but also has an app, which um, basically talks about uh, their rights for being women and for being migrants, and, and is all oriented to sexual rights and reproductive rights. And there are some tips and, and some uh, what to do in case kind of thing. And we use that with NGOs and also with IOM in Central America to um, create awareness, but also to support women, migrant women supporting other migrant women. So a really nice uh, participatory exercise. So I mentioned um, that uh, we did field work in, in, in uh, two sites of, of displacement, uh, the Venezuelan women and girls moving to Manaus and Boa Vista in Brazil and uh, to uh, Colombia, and uh, those returnees uh, in Central America. So uh, a lot of uh, women. Now, as an example of what we did, I wanted to bring just uh, some um, numbers uh, to show you uh, the, the significance of the, or the distinctive gender features of, of these uh, displacement uh, flows that we were looking at. Uh, we know that 8 million people uh, left uh, Venezuela since 2015. Half of them are women and girls. And we actually um, interviewed 1,212 in Brazil, in the border area. And what we um, uh, 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 found out is that most uh, of them, 66%, are age 18 to 34. They're very young. They are very... Um, in, in, in vulnerable situations, they travel alone, 34% of them, and 10% uh, were pregnant during that crossing. That is a significant number. And of course, the other important thing here is that we're talking about women and girls uh, that are living for reasons, or for practical reasons of hunger, health, and violence, not necessarily living places of, of, of conflict. So these are very significant aspects that uh, we, um, looked at and, and, and relate to how issues of abuse, stigma, discrimination, etc. affect their, um, th their experience, particularly in terms of sexual and reproductive health. So given those compelling reasons uh, for FLY, uh, we uh, also saw that 
the way they cross and the way they receive information, they are um, uh, they, they are welcome or they, they are received a, a hugely affect their uh, sexual and reproductive health. Uh, needs and rights. And this is just a very schematic way of presenting uh, the uh, barriers that they themselves identified, uh, but not only the barriers, uh, some of which were mentioned at the beginning of, of, of this seminar, but also the consequences, because the, cons the consequences are determinants of health in the longer run. So uh, take issues of discrimination, for example, discrimination significantly impact the health seeking behavior of women and girls, uh, the exacerbate vulnerabilities in many different ways. And what we have seen is of tethered violence, institutional violence, interpersonal violence, all these that reflect um, uh, aspects of uh, sexual and reproductive health uh, issues, but also mental health uh, impact, and of course, uh, uh, prevent some women and girls from seeking necessary health uh, services. Like these, there are all these examples that uh, uh, we uh, show here, and this is part of many outputs that we uh, also systematized in terms of books and, and papers and reports and recommendations together with IOM, but also um, in, other, in other venues and in other spaces. So this is an example of our research uh, findings, and this is an example of how we systematize uh, the, the outcomes. Uh, we have a photo book, we have a documentary, the Agape Guide that I mentioned, and other aspects. And I'm sharing here with all of you the links to the resources in case um, you, uh, you want to explore, if, in case it's useful, and we will be very happy to share more as well. I just wanted to, to finish um, by saying, going back to these uh, aspects, uh, the fact that uh, it, the, these women now are uh, in places where are literally collapsing in terms of resources uh, and, 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 and services, what we started to see is the uh, reproduction of precarity when they are settling or protracted displacement as uh, many of these women in Brazil and Colombia started to move to the Darien, taking very, very dangerous routes, reproducing all these dangers and risks and affecting hugely their sexual and reproductive health uh, uh, and rights. So, so we are in a situation where this is a, 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 a moving target and we have realized that, that all the legalistic uh, and humanitarian approaches to uh, immediate uh, response are not working uh, or are not appropriate or, or, or enough, not, not sufficient uh, to create conditions for these women and girls to have independent and autonomous lives in the places that they choose to settle. And that's why they keep moving. So all these are headlines, but very, very happy to uh, discuss later on uh, in the session. Thank you. Thank you so much indeed, Pia, and also uh, to David, who's joined us. And very, very important body of work highlighting, as you have um, as you have articulated, Pia, exactly what needs to be done, what is working, what isn't working. Um, so a real call to action in terms of making sure that uh, these fund really fundamental issues are not, you know, systematically ingrained throughout the migration cycle and uh, resulting in in more movements, as you have highlighted so very clearly. Thank you very much indeed for the links too. We'll make sure that the resources are part of our gender um, and migration research policy action lab uh, community of practice and share those with with our broader network. Um, so thanks again very much for for really taking us through a, a very substantial body of work and, and a, a very important one as well. I'm now delighted to uh, invite Associate Professor Tarani Loganathan to be able to present her work. She's based at the University of Malaya and has an extensive body of work. Again, we're delighted to be able to, to showcase your work, um, Tarani on a range of different um, uh, issues related to migrant access to healthcare, including to sexual and reproductive health services for women and girls. Uh, she's also an Atlantic Fellow for Health Equity in Southeast Asia. Um, and we're delighted that you can join us today, Tarani. I'll hand over to you now for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. And uh, thank you for inviting me for this uh, Gen Make uh, Research Webinar. And uh, today I've been asked to present on migrant women's access to sexual reproductive health. 
in Malaysia. Um, I only have seven minutes, but uh, I really need to explain the context of migration in Malaysia before we proceed to the topic. So in Malaysia, we, we are migrant dependent. We, about 10% of our labor workforce is actually from migrant labor. Um, the vulnerable groups in Malaysia are the uh, migrant workers who are predominantly low and semi-skilled, uh, about 2.7 million documented. Uh, the undocumented numbers are much more. We also have refugees, asylum seekers, and stateless people. Um, the women migrant workers are about 20% of that number, but the figures could be much more with the undocumented numbers. Migrant workers face multiple complex barriers to healthcare access in Malaysia. The most, uh, the main barriers are financial barriers, legal status, they have to um, present uh, documents at public clinics and hospitals, and language barriers. What we have in Malaysia is a mixed public-private healthcare system, which is common in most middle-income countries. We have a highly subsidized healthcare system for Malaysian citizens. It's almost free, but non-citizens pay a very much higher, steeper price. And it's at every level, at outpatient um, deposits for admissions and daily ward charges. So these, this is pro prohibitively high. Also, another barrier is um, the presentation of um, documents, the document checks at public clinics. Healthcare workers are actually, um, they, are, they are obliged to report undocumented uh, migrants to immigration. So that is a barrier for access. Um, migrant workers, documented migrant workers have uh, healthcare insurance. It's mandatory healthcare insurance. Uh, but those insurance does not cover outpatient care. It does not cover reproductive uh, health care. So for uh, documented for legal uh, uh, migrant workers coming into Malaysia, they are obliged to have uh, um, pre-employment and uh, annual medical examinations. And these are uh, requirements and these checks um, are for infectious disease, communicable disease, but also for pregnancy. So if a worker is found pregnant, uh, they, they do not get their work permit and they are liable to be deported. So this study was done, uh, it was a quali qualitative interviews of multiple stakeholders and it was done over a 12 month period. So the major findings that we found were mostly re regarding to the health policy and employment courses. And the rest were around um, four areas of uh, sexual reproductive health. So the important thing that faced them and the main um, barrier was actually the, um, the fact that uh, pregnancy was prohibited, uh, not just in in terms of um, the, the national policy, the, the, the work permits and so on, but employment courses also, uh, uh, employment contracts also forbid, forbid uh, pregnancies and marriages in, uh, in jobs. And this was seen as highly um, discriminatory, um, equating pregnancy with illness. And um, the consequence of being found to be pregnant is termination from employment. And if they choose to be pregnant and stay in the country, they are undocumented. Um, with this prohibition of pregnancy, um, there, there is actually no access to family planning. There's still no access to family planning. The, um, the current prevalent sort of a moral religious idea in Malaysia is um, encouraging pregnancy is, uh, I mean, encouraging access to contraception is seen to encourage promiscuity. So that's not something um, employers provide. Yet family planning is actually an important investment because um, unwanted pregnancies is directly uh, leading to job loss. So in Malaysia, we actually have universal health coverage. We have a very mature MCH service and this is freely available for citizens. 
But for non-citizens, it's an issue because the financial constraints and also the legal barriers. So female migrants, they would seek care from private sector. And um, there, the, the barriers they have is um, maybe they don't have the, uh, the full options of services and so on, the advice that's given to them. This might be because of language barriers and so on. Um, knowing the, the, the loaded, uh, have, becoming pregnant uh, in, well, while you're employed is not a, a good situation to be in. So the abortion decision is linked with financial security, their, their support from their employers and partners. Abortion is legal in Malaysia, okay, but the, it's not exactly available everywhere. There are a lot of cultural norms and um, stigma against abortion. And um, when it's available in private sector, it's actually hard to find and it's very expensive. So um, medical abortion, though, is recommended in Malaysia. We do not have, uh, it's not part of our, um, it's, it's, it's actually not in our drug directory. So um, it's not easily available. So again, um, those who opt to be pregnant have no choice but to go to private care because of uh, all the barriers in public care. Um, they, but private care is expensive for um, antenatal and delivery and so on. So they avoid that and they seek um, traditional mid midwives and so on. Not because of cultural reasons, because it's, it's expensive. And um, this actually has poor obstructive outcomes because of um, delayed booking and uh, incomplete follow-ups. Also, hospital births are not really um, something they go for because um, it's actually linked to immigration. Um, there have been reported cases of um, women being um, arrested after delivering babies at hospitals. So in Malaysia, we have one-stop crisis centers in our government hospitals. They are um, at the emergency rooms. And this, this is actually for gender-based violence. And it's a place where um, you have health services, you have welfare, you have um, uh, law enforcement, legal advice, and so on. So a lot of things happen in one place. Uh, but the problem with it is it's linked with law enforcement. I mean, basically, you need a police, you need to have made a police report to go to that one-stop crisis center. And um, there's a lot of barriers towards that, a lot of fear towards approaching the police to um, for anything because of um, pregnancy is prohibited. So they, they are likely to be undocumented. Also, another issue is the lack of shelters. So we have in Malaysia, we have government welfare shelters and we have shelters run by NGOs. These are actually limited even for locals. And um, it's actually quite difficult for non-citizens to get in. The other thing is the link with the legal. So you need a court order to get into um, a government protected uh, shelter. So how do we move forward with all these kind of policies? I think a very strong political will and um, basically everybody needs to come, come aboard to think about what, what is important and how do we shift forward the restrictive immigrati immigration and labor policies that we have. Okay. Um, sexual reproductive health education needs to be linked with essential services. Uh, and this needs to come with come from employers. Okay, so it's no point giving education, but there's no access to services, there's no access to basic contraceptives. So that needs to come together. And um, UHC, so our commitment to which UHC should actually look at vulnerable populations. Um, we should, especially pregnant women. So Pregnant women in Malaysia, citizens are uh, actually free, get free, free treatment. So we should reduce the financial barriers and um, de-link the services from immigration arrests. And um, look again, re-examine the uh, workplace insurance for foreign workers to include outpatient care and sexual reproductive health services. 
CSOs actually uh, provide a lot of uh, services and help for non-citizens, vulnerable populations. Their role should be encouraged and strengthened. Okay, thank you. So this is uh, my um, presentations and um, uh, these are my publications and uh, number three is the paper that this is based on. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Tarani. Really uh, appreciate you taking the time to step us through what is quite a different um, geography and regulatory environment as uh, we heard from, from Pia and David. Part of the, the, the beauty of having these research webinars is to hear about how that governance and regulatory arrangements really do uh, determine in so many aspects um, uh, the health of migrant women and girls. And, and you've highlighted that so clearly in your presentation and we really do um, appreciate it very much. We can see that, as you said, the, the social norms dictate uh, some of the governance and regulatory environment arrangements and some of those um, barriers are very significant ones uh, uh, to the you know, ongoing health and care and well-being of uh, migrant women and girls in Malaysia. Thank you again so much for your presentation. Our third speaker for today is Dr. Bushra Asarag, and she is from the National School of Public Health in Morocco. And again, a very different geography, and we are delighted that Bushra can join us uh, this morning. Bushra is a physician with a PhD also in public health, and she is an expert on sexual and reproductive health rights and an active member of national and international civil associations in the field, including as the president of the association Together for Sexual and Reproductive Health Rights. Thank you again for joining us, Bushra. We are looking forward to your presentation as well. Uh, take us through your work. Uh, again, a very extensive, extensive body of work. We only have a short time, but we certainly will be sharing your resources, your materials with our network as well. Over to Bushra, and thanks again for joining us. Thank you a lot. I'm uh, very happy to be with you and uh, giving me this opportunity to share with you what uh, we did in Morocco about uh, migrants, specifically in sexual reproductive health uh, services, and what is the barriers and what is the, the strategies that uh, we uh, implement to reduce these uh, barriers. Uh, my presentation which will be around the context migrant uh, and sexual reproductive health rights in Morocco, various obstacles, and the end call for action. As you know, the Kingdom of Morocco is the northwestern country in the Maghreb region of North Africa, with a population around 36 million. Morocco is a constitutional monarchy with the, the elected parliament and the official language are Arabic and Amazigh. The Moroccan dialects of Arabic and French are also widely spoken. Morocco is officially divided in 12 administrative regions. And for the past decade, Morocco has achieved significant social and economic progress. And the, the, the resulting growth has led to improve, reducing extremely poverty, increased life expectancy. What is about uh, sexual reproductive health and migrants? As uh, we know all, migrants has uh, increased risk of unwanted, uh, unwanted pregnancy and uh, in uh, maternal death and morbidity and STI and sexual violence. 60% of preventable maternal death, 53% uh, of under five death and 43% of a person of neonatal death occur in context of conflict and displacement. More than 80% of high mortality countries have suffered from recent conflicts, recurrent natural disasters or both. And uh, we have 500 women day every day for from complications related to pregnancy and childbirth. In uh, Morocco, we uh, have we did there several uh, studies and evidence, and the migrants face significant challenges regarding their sexual and reproductive health, often experiencing, experiencing deficiency compared to Moroccan women. Migrant women, in particular, um, uh, had the height risks, including unwanted pregnancy, as I said uh, before. 
uh, ACI and AIDS transmission and the pregnancy with the harmful outcomes due to, to limited access to sexual reproductive health services and also information due to different culture and uh, uh, afraid to do uh, even if they are the irregular migration. There is also this uh, pro proportionality throughout our uh, studies, higher in meted need of family planning among migrants, refugees, and uh, culturally diverse women exacerbating vulnerability and then hindering their ability to make informed reproductive choice. The low prevalence of modern contraceptive use in sub-Saharan Africa. In Morocco, we have sub-Saharan migrants, le francophone or anglophone, further exacerbation of sexual reproductive health disparities with the contraceptive utilization rates lower uh, than uh, Moroccan women. Uh, and we say here that uh, we have only 30, 31% of fresh speaker sub-Saharan migrants and uh, only 24% for English uh, speakers. And injectable contraceptive is the most widely used uh, method in uh, uh, sub-Saharan uh, migrant women uh, uh, comparing to the Moroccan uh, women whom used the uh, pills. For Morocco, uh, you know, uh, you, uh, Morocco stands a crossroad of various forms of migration, transitioning from a transit country before, and now we are the host nation given its strategic geographical proximity to uh, Europe. In 2030, Significant milestones were achieved with the release of the CNDR. CNDR is National Center of Human Rights report of the, on the rights of refugees and immigrants. And uh, uh, after this uh, report, followed by the high royal guidelines from uh, His Majesty the King, Mohammed VI, marking the commitment, high commitment to address migration challenges comprehensively. Subsequent year saw the formulation of uh, key policies and strategies, including national migration policy and the national immigration strategies in 2014, signaling Morocco's proactive approach toward managing migration. The establishment of the Migra Migration Observatory in Rabat in 2017 further unders un underscored Morocco's commitment to evidence-based policy making and comprehensive migration governance. In 2018, Morocco, 18, Morocco participated in the Intergovernmental Conference to adopt a global co compact for safe, orderly, and regular migration, reaffirming its commitment to international cooperation in manage, managing migration effectively. And this uh, uh, meeting is hosted in Morocco, in Marrakesh. The development of national health and immigration strategy plan. We have two strategies since 2017. The first one, 2017-2021, and now 2021-2025. Reflected Morocco's recognition of the intersection between migration and health, aiming to address the specific health care needs of migrants and refugees. Lastly, uh, in 2023, Morocco hosts also the convening of the third global consultation on migration and refugees, uh, provided the platform for dialogue and collaboration further solidifying Morocco's role as a, uh, as a role to advocacy of, for migrants and refugees health rights in the global uh, stage. Uh, what is the, the the situation about migration? We have only the estimated about uh, 98,000 uh, uh, migrants compared uh, with uh, 53 million, uh, million thousand in uh, 20, uh, 2000. That uh, means that we have most and most migrants in Morocco. The Africans uh, represent uh, 42%. And uh, the most of uh, them, two thirds, uh, are from sub-Saharan Africa. And in two, in 2014 and 2017, more than 
50 uh, thousand regularization for migrants in Morocco and also refugees uh, grow uh, up uh, between 2007 and 2022. What about uh, SRH services? Ashid Matui, I will present now the implemented services for migrants and uh, how we did to improve and uh, involve capacity of uh, health providers and what we did in research about uh, sexual reproductive health rights migrants. This is several achievements among migrants throughout our strategies. And, uh, in, uh, and uh, we see that uh, the, the services of sexual reproductive health are free in health primary care, also in the hospital level. Consenatal care, postnatal care, STI, family planning, breast and cervical cancer detection, or components on sexual reproductive health and services are for free for Moroccan as well for migrants. It's the same package, the same prestation. And elaboration of referential of sexual reproductive health treatment of migrants at health primary care. Uh, specifically for uh, gender-based uh, violence, but it's the same things for Moroccans, women, and uh, migrants. And uh, the particularity is about female genital mutilation. In Morocco, we don't have uh, this practice, but uh, we uh, give now to try to implement and to uh, have a comprehensive uh, uh, care for uh, the migrant women. And also straining mental health and psychosocial socio social support. We know that uh, uh, the traveling uh, from uh, the, the 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 country, the own country for migrant to Morocco, it's not uh, uh, easy uh, traject and traveling, and we can have a lot of problem throughout uh, this uh, traveling. And uh, we try to uh, put uh, psychosocial support, but it's not enough. It's uh, poor in uh, Morocco. Also, we try to have communication and awareness and sensitize community about uh, communication with migrants and to have uh, uh, to to broke luck for uh, uh, cultural and uh, barrier cultural and to have. Uh, community with the uh, respect of diversity. And uh, we have a lot of uh, kind of uh, uh, tools and uh, like capsule in French, Arabic and English to sensitize uh, migrants that uh, they can have access uh, free to uh, uh, our uh, health uh, center and also uh, translate a lot of uh, uh, tools uh, to sensitize uh, migrants about family planning because the, as we say that it's not uh, enough women that uh, practice and uh, use the method of contraception and we try to sensitize them about this. Also, the, we organize uh, uh, information session of uh, sexual reproductive needs of the migrant population for health professional and civil society, we try to have a mixed uh, session uh, between uh, NGOs and uh, health providers to put this coordination together. And uh, because we have uh, uh, lack for language and culture, and we have community uh, NGOs uh, from uh, migrants and we try to put this coordination between health providers and uh, uh, migrant uh, NGOs. Information and awareness uh, manual of NGOs in the health of vulnerable migrants, model of maternal health of NGOs to raise awareness about uh, migrants and we have sample uh, message to uh, give to these NGOs and these NGOs can transfer it and synthesize uh, migrants. Also, uh, also about capacity building of health providers and social actors in social in sexual reproductive health. We have uh, we organized in Morocco in 2018. We started with Morocco, but after we share it uh, with uh, other uh, uh, countries like Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, and Yemen. Uh, about uh, one uh, trainer. Uh, about uh, health and uh, migration with several uh, modules, health and uh, migration concept, interculturality and uh, diversity in migration, 
sexual reproductive health and migration, mental health and psychosocial support, communicable disease, non communicable disease. And now we start to develop and uh, we already develop it a module. We add another module, uh, human rights, gender, and uh, migration. And we did a lot of uh, training for our health professional from uh, face to face, or also using our platform e learning. And this project is with the, our school uh, direction of uh, who hold the, the units of migration and the IUM in Morocco. We did a lot of uh, activities with IUM in Morocco, course on e learning health children, including migrants. We did already two cohorts, uh, and each cohort we have around 30, 30 hundred health provider. Also, we did the exchange, exchange and sharing evidence in sexual reproductive health and migrants. And we hold in Morocco in 22 uh, health uh, uh, migrant health winter school with the partnership with the IUM Morocco. And uh, we focus on sexual and reproductive health, mental health, psychosocial support. And the second one in 2022, about we add the now social protection about uh, insurance for migrants. And uh, also we have uh, uh, sexual and reproductive health and uh, with the Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, and Yemen, this is a regional project. Uh, about monitoring and evaluation to have data, this is luck for us. This is the uh, very big issues. And we revise our national health information system to include a part of migrant nationality and we have the same uh, health information system uh, about maternal health, family planning, HIV, early detection, diabetes, hypertension, mental health, and uh, what the oral consultation uh, that we have. This is we include uh, migrant components in our national health uh, information system. About research, we uh, did a lot of research with IUM in Morocco or with other uh, uh, national union uh, agency, like with UNICEF studies the expectation and needs of migrant children in the context of COVID-19. And uh, several uh, studies, we have uh, the, the second national bio behavior study on the integrating health of migrants. With the, this is in two, 2022. And we are with Global Fund, UNAIDS, and OUM Morocco. Mapping of mental health services and psychosocial support available uh, in Casablanca. It's a region uh, with the Spanish cooperation with several, we have uh, several uh, studies. And also in our school, we each uh, year for a master's study, master's students, we have a quota about 5% uh, uh, of our uh, uh, the topics is around migrants. And uh, we have uh, all uh, access to health services, epidemiological profile of migrants, barriers to access, and all this. This is the opportunity to improve and translate this research recommendation and to concrete uh, measures and action to promote the health of migration, specifically in sexual reproductive health. I think we'll have to uh, leave it now uh, Bushra, because we've run a little bit over time. But what I would yeah, ask I is if it's okay if we share your PowerPoint uh, presentation and load that up onto our microsite so that this people is, uh, can the, read the, this. I can further. only say the barriers. <laughs> uh, we've, we do have some questions in the chat and we have gone quite okay. a bit over time. Okay, so okay, I'll give no you problem. One, okay. one more minute. If you have one more slide that is a summary, that would be fantastic. I, I will I will tell uh, in conclusion that is uh, there is some barriers uh, related to uh, data and also coordinating between sectors we we don't have enough uh, enter uh, the, the migration in all policies we have not this coordination with health and migration service migration social and NGOs not enough and we have. Uh, uh, often and unidentified uh, uh, lack to to identify, identify uh, the victims of violence because uh, uh, especially throughout irregular migrants they are afraid to be expelled from uh, countries that it's not uh, the reality but they are afraid and migrant women and young girls from different ethnic have different uh, perspectives uh, needs and expectations for uh, services. And uh, that's all.
It's Thank not you so only much. The, uh, this is called for action. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bushra. And uh, what I've really enjoyed in, in your presentation and across all of the presentations actually is putting it in context because that's so important to be able to actually outline the migration situation across migration and displacement sort of impacts, what's changed over time, and then the regulatory in environment. Notwithstanding the differences, there are some very key similarities, including the barriers and the obstacles that you have highlighted uh, at the end there. Thank you again for joining us and very, very rich uh, resources, which we'll be delighted to share with our partner network. We do have some questions Marie, you're muted. Thank you. Thanks for letting me know. Um, and uh, that's just went on there quickly. Uh, so I will turn to our first uh, two uh, speakers, Pia and Tarani, to really answer some of the questions that have come through in the chat. Particularly, thank you to um, Ingela Norberg, who has posted several questions in here. From a development perspective, her real questions relate to how can development actors and donors in particular support um, access to sexual and reproductive health uh, services for migrants. So that's uh, one of the key questions she has put forward. And are there ongoing initiatives related to the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration or the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals? Her final question is related to the coordination of various um, forums that may be occurring or joint engagements at the national, regional or global levels. Now that's a big question. We could have a whole seminar just on that last question there. So perhaps in the context of time, I will turn to Pia and then to Tarani to answer the first couple of questions. What can donors do to help? I mean, that's a really critical uh, issue. And also how does that relate to the GCM and the SDGs? Over to you first, Pia. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. David. This is an excellent question. And this is the question that should follow, as you said, Marie, uh, uh, another seminar, because uh, in our project, and, and I think across uh, the presentations, what becomes very clear is that this is not just a, an issue of immediate health responses, but the, this relates to a broader issues of structural uh, inequalities and, and even uneven development in, in most of the places where these women and girls are either settling or, for, or finding first refuge. So this is a problem of development and it's a problem of local development as well. And I think if we approach um, uh, the responses from uh, an issue of uh, or the perspective of uh, regularization, which is uh, mostly what's happening in South America and in Central America, uh, aspects of regularization of, of visa management, that is important, perhaps uh, for legalizing access to healthcare and other services, but that's not enough to create conditions for uh, longer term settlement in an independent and and and, and um, uh, autonomous way. I think we mentioned across the presentations issues of poverty, issues of precarious and informal work, issues of lack of information, issues of uh, institutional factors more broadly. Those are developmental issues that affect the migrant populations but, uh, or the displaced populations, but more broadly, the local populations as well. I think if we don't approach this from a developmental point of view, this is going to be uh, undermining any durable or sustainable solution uh, uh, and, and will create also more vulnerabilities. And finally, I would say it's an issue of resources. We know that all these actors uh, that are uh, in, the, in the aid and, and, and development uh, arena, uh, UNHCR and, and others are very underfunded. Uh, they don't receive the funding from donors or countries or, or member states that uh, can support these developmental approaches. And institutions like the World Bank are funding some aspects, but it's very compartmentalized and there are issues of implementation. So it's a really complex issue that needs to be, these are the determinants of, of health. So we need to bring, this is an excellent question, and I think we need to bring this perspective of development to uh, responses to health. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pia. I'll hand over to Tarani now. Sorry, I was saying, I, let me unmute myself. Um, in the Malaysian context, I think um, importantly, I, 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 you know, I mean, in the 
uh, migration needs to be in the na national context as well. When you think about um, um, all the goals that we have to achieve UHC, the SDGs, uh, achieving uh, SDG at 3.7 and so on. Um, in the national context, we do not think of migrants. Okay, we are thinking about citizens. So uh, that needs to be in the conversation. So from international bodies and organizations, donor organizations, they need to ask. So your figures are really good. Um, it, is it representative for all the groups? Because for in Malaysia, our maternal mortality rates are really low. Our development goals, are, uh, I mean, um, figures are pretty good. But it, do we break them down to migration levels? What are the maternal mortality rates for migrant women or un, uh, non-citizens in Malaysia and so on? What are the abortion rates in Malaysia? What are the abortion rates with this under, um, migrant populations? We don't know. So um, in that sense, so um, that kind of, uh, how do you say, it? To, to keep the government or keep the uh, powers to be accountable and keep that conversation going. So they monitor uh, in the country. So in, in the national context, I think uh, it's just not a priority um, because who takes ownership of uh, this, this group? Is it the Ministry of Health? Is it uh, the Labour Department? Is it immigration? Is it police? Um, yeah, so it's it's more complicated than that, right? Thanks, Sarani. And, and it really goes to um, Bushra's excellent sort of presentation. And I know, Bushra, you did highlight some of the, the obstacles, you know, some of the challenges and so forth. But there is so much that we can learn globally from Morocco and Morocco's leadership in, in this area. I mean, you highlighted the inclusive approach that Morocco has developed, which is is in contrast um, to other uh, countries and other regions, very, very clearly. And I know that there's a lot more work to be done, but Morocco has really led, certainly from a migration perspective, right, right the way through, especially on the GCM uh, and the implementation of the GCM. And that inclusive approach is something that so many other countries can really uh, learn from. And that's why I kind of suggested, well, perhaps we could have an entire uh, webinar just on this sort of topic alone around national, regional and, and global um, initiatives to bring this together. But I wanted to hand over, give you the last word, uh, Bushra, really to highlight how you've seen those changes in terms of the political leadership of, from Morocco and what that has meant for your work in terms of being able to implement, not just with sort of financial resources and human resources, but the issue that Tarani has talked about, which is really political will. Thank you. Uh, I, I think I just uh, I want to add some word about SDGs. Uh, in uh, Morocco, sincerely, we, uh, we consider immigrants as a, uh, as part of Morocco. And if as part of Morocco, and if we want to attend uh, like a region of maternal mortality, we want to have in 2030, 36 uh, per, uh, per days per 100,000 live birth. And for neonatal rates is 10, uh, seven. If we want to have this, we must include also um, uh, migrant women because they are part of, of uh, our population. And uh, sincerely, we, we say that uh, th there is not now for us about sexual reproductive health uh, services. We, we are not only the, the problem of health, because we want to have inclusive strategy. Inclusive strategy, we cannot, uh, if we have services, this migrant women cannot came if they, they are not have money to have transport of we have the indirect costs and we must integrate this woman in the social life and uh, integrate migrant in social life and uh, i think that we must have uh, the inclusion strategy not only health strategy uh, the, the the second one that uh, we must have evidence more evidence for that. We did lots of studies in Morocco because we cannot uh, develop uh, strategies of developed intervention without base evidence. And we want to generate more evidence, more uh, data to uh, see clearly what what is the the where we can focus with the, the migrants and what is the challenges and what is 
uh, do things that we can achieve and uh, do luck. And for that, progressively, we want to implement uh, the innovative strategy that inclusive, we must have inclusive uh, such as health, social, uh, work, uh, opportunity of work, and NGOs. And NGOs, uh, sincerely, I, I, I thank for them. They uh, play a very, very good uh, role uh, to integrate, to uh, to have uh, access to the, the sexual reproductive health, sexual reproductive health services. And the third one, component that we have a lot of challenges is uh, the services, human rights based and equality gender. We don't, because we have only this problem with Moroccan women, not only migrant women. And we have this problem and we try to develop and to empowerment women and young girls. And the uh, migrant women and the uh, young girls migrants but it uh, are part of women's Moroccans, women's and uh, girls women, uh, Moroccans. It's a uh, very, it's not uh, easy, but uh, with evidence, I think, with evidence, commitment, and uh, community participant participation, we can uh, have a good uh, result. Fantastic, Busha. You've said it better than anybody else, I think, can say it in terms of bringing all of those uh, parts together, having an evidence-based approach, which I think everybody uh, on the call certainly is working towards and agreeing with most, most certainly. But importantly, I think bringing together uh, NGOs, that has been another civil society element, has been another key aspect that's been right the way through all of the presentations uh, as well. Thank you again for joining us. We are a little bit over time and we have covered the questions that are in the chat. There's also some very nice comments in there thanking the presenters, which I would also like to do. Thank you so much uh, for sharing your insights, for sharing your research and analysis, for highlighting the key issues in your geographic contexts and the importance of international collaboration and partnership in this important space, especially around gender equality, not just for migrants and for also women and girls, but also for citizens, as you have also highlighted, Busha, really important to have that inclusive approach. But thanks again for joining us. Uh, just a quick reminder too for participants on the call that our next GenMig research web webinar is on the 3rd of July. The uh, registration is in the chat, so please do join us. We will also be sharing this recording and, of course, all the resources, resources that our excellent speakers have shared with us today as part of our GenMig uh, partner network. So thanks again. We'll sign off now. Thanks again to our presenters and to everybody who's joined. An excellent, excellent discussion. More work to be done, but it's great to see that uh, some positive steps are being taken in certain uh, geographies, most especially. Thanks again.